record. Okay. Welcome to Art 116. It's Monday, second week of the quarter. Oh my God. Oh, and I've been talking about um, trying to do a graphic design project, trying to put together text and image on the topic of Martin Luther King, civil rights movement, social justice, something like that. And so today I was going to do a presentation or two that might help move and get us a little bit closer to that idea. And then <clears throat> I'm interested in either having you guys share on screen share um, your project in any anywhere that you are in the process. So if all you have is a is a Word document that's a piece of paper, you know, on the desktop in Word, and you've been able to bring in a, a photograph and you and you made a text box, but you haven't really put them together yet. I can help with trying to figure out how to start to finesse that as far as the graphic design part of that goes, because that's where the the artistry and the design all lives. <clears throat> but first, I want to go down a rabbit hole. I want to digress. And so um, I uh, want to do a little bit of a screen share and <clears throat> a quick, a quick um, thing on typography. So here we go, screen share. And a short history of typography. Oh my God, okay. So the question is, where am I gonna put you guys? I'm gonna put you guys like somewhere out of the way so that we can see this. And I hope you guys can see this. Okay, short history of typography. Okay, and oh, I don't want you guys up there. Okay, so what? No, go away. Okay, um, here we go. Um, there we go. Oh gosh. <sighs> okay. Um, I'm going to minimize you guys completely. So typography is based on handwriting. Um, <clears throat> the written word was disseminated by scribes for governments and churches and the aristocracy um, ever since um, language and especially the written word writing, handwriting was uh, invented, discovered, developed, you know, three or 4,000 years ago, four or 5,000 years ago, heck, let's say that, going all the way back to at least ancient Egypt and before. So as civilizations became more complex, they had to figure out ways of communicating in really complex ways so that they could, you know, direct things like commerce and trade and also wars. It seems like wars, religion, and commerce and trade are like the three big things that they had to kind of um, administer. And so writing is kind of almost an administrative thing for codifying the language and being able to communicate with each other with a written word. Okay, so typography, the type faces that we use, the fonts that we use are based on handwriting. And so I'm taking an example from the Middle Ages, an illuminated manuscript um, that's, you know, at least 700 years old, this goes back, I think, to around the, the, um, the 1300s or 1400s or something like that, right at the end of the Middle Ages and just before the beginning of the Renaissance. <clears throat> so um, with the Renaissance, one of the things that comes with that is Gutenberg's um, uh, invention of movable type for the printing press. Now, Gutenberg didn't actually invent the printing press. There had been printing presses in use um, towards the uh, end of the Middle Ages uh, for printing books like Bibles and things like that. But to actually be able to print individual books or um, you know, what came to be known as leaflets, broadsheets, or newspapers, you really had to have movable type. And that was really the dawn of the, the really the publishing industry as we've come to know it today. So at the end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of the Renaissance, with the advent of the printing press and movable type, we get uh, the idea of an interest in developing typography. And so calligraphy, which is the art of beautiful writing as illustrated in an illuminated manuscript, calligraphy is the origin of typography. 
Um, and we can just look up here and see that all of these individual um, letters and words that have been handwritten by a scribe into this book and really are part of a very carefully designed uh, of page design, leaving enough room in the margins for marginalia, as we call all of this stuff, either decoration in the book's margins or actually places where people can write notations and stuff in the margins. And then every um, text block in the book um, is the same size and the same placement on the page so that the book has an overall publication design to it. So that's really cool. Let's see, I've got to figure out how to advance my thing here. Okay, so I'm going to move this out of the way again. <clears throat> and so I've gone through all of the different kinds of um, fonts that are available like in Microsoft Word, but in any other um, graphic design software that you might be working with in terms of working with fonts. And I've kind of put them into three basic font families to make it just a little bit easier. Now, this is just arbitrary and it's just me, but it helps, I think, a whole hell of a lot. So the first font family that I would like to talk about is the serif font. Um, the serif font, and the, this example is in New York uh, Times New Roman, basically is the name of the font. And that is a serif font. And serifs are these cute little um, strokes that begin and end every letter. And as a matter of fact, every letter is constructed as if it were being written with a calligraphic pen. So that um, when you start at the beginning of the S, you have this downward stroke right here, and then you move sideways. And with the calligraphic pen, your line actually becomes thinner as you move sideways. Then as you move down or um, vertically, your line becomes thicker using a calligraphic pen. And then as you move sideways or horizontally again, the line gets thinner. And then this last little uh, stroke here is a serif. And so all of these letters begin with some kind of little grace note, some kind of little stroke that begins every letter and ends every letter. And those are called serifs. And so any kind of formal font that you see that is particularly has a history with publishing, um, it goes back in time to the publishing and printing industry. And these things go back hundreds of years to the beginning of the printing industry, basically. These are all serif fonts. Now, why do we use serifs in um, publications, in, in text, especially in textbooks and in, in book publishing? Because these little serifs actually become really nice little connective tissue that help the individual letters kind of flow together visually. And so when this is in really small font and really small typeface size on the page, um, your eye doesn't get eye strain from reading rapidly uh, from word to word and putting them together into sentences and having the sentences flow as you're reading. So serif fonts are really good because they're legible, they reduce eye strain in the viewer, and they're very good for the publishing industry. So now we come to the sans serif font, sans serif, um, a French word sans meaning without um, or doesn't have it or none. Um, so sans serif fonts really got going in the 20th century, the end of the 19th, the early 20th century, as modernism um, really got on a roll. With um, the Industrial Revolution in high gear and all kinds of new um, um, discoveries happening in science and art and philosophy and all over the place, but mostly in science. The 20th century and modernism thought that it could kind of throw away all of the old stuff, all of tradition and everything, and kind of reinvent the world and reinvent the Western world in a whole new way. And sans serif fonts were part of that because it, it was a kind of a modern, bold way of communicating. Um, so these kinds of fonts were developed for the publishing industry in the 20th century. And by the 1960s and 70s, when things were really rocking and rolling, and we had all kinds of really wonderful hippie uh, publications out there, 
we finally realized that sans serif fonts are not actually very easy to read, especially in small sizes, especially you know on large uh, pages of dense type, because the sans serif font doesn't have any other serifs. And so each individual letter scans more like an individual letter, and it's much harder to see them um, building words and sentences than a serif font. This causes more eye strain when it's read in small, when it's um, published in small sizes. And so for the most part, after the 1970s, sans serif fonts have been relegated to headlines, subheadings, and those larger areas of text where you might want to call attention to something in a different way than in the traditional way. Um, so you're going to see now in most newspapers, sans serif fonts are used for headlines and subheads, and the serif fonts are still used for the body text of the publication. Finally, we get to novelty fonts. Novelty fonts are ridiculous uh, because they're very kind of difficult to read. They do not scan very well, and they, they really uh, don't work well for um, body text in the publishing industry. This particular novelty font right here is called Edwardian Script, and it's really the kind of thing that you would use in a wedding invitation. Um, it's a very fancy frilly thing kind of based on handwriting. And so lots of different um, novelty fonts are out there, and some of them um, lend themselves to particular uses like um, movie posters and movie poster headlines, um, Broadway posters and Broadway um, uh, uh, programs and stuff like that have really certain kinds of fonts that say show business and they say Broadway and <clears throat> show tunes and all that kind of stuff. And so these cultural ideas are baked into the font itself because of where it's been used historically and uh, what people have come to expect it from each one of these fonts. So um, let me just see. Um, fonts or typefaces come in three main families, serif, sans serif, and decorative or novelty fonts. Serif fonts trace their oranges back to calligraphic handwriting and contain little strokes that begin and end each letter. Then I've changed fonts down here actually to a sans serif font. Um, sans serif fonts first appeared in the 19th century and are considered modern. They're block letters without serifs like Arial, which this stuff is written in. So we want to just, I've got two more slides to really talk about and show you guys. And I have got to get this thing to go. Um, so let's see, did I go? I skipped, a, I skipped one. I skipped that one. Okay, so here I have, I have something that is an example from Albrecht Durer's Treatise on Measurement from 1525. So at the, at the beginning of the, the Renaissance, we call this the High Renaissance. This is when um, Leonardo and Michelangelo and Raphael were working down in Italy. And in Germany, Albrecht Durer was one of the um, Renaissance artists uh, in the Northern Renaissance. And in addition to um, woodblock printing and painting, he was also a designer and designed fonts. And so this, this panel right here that shows the A's, B's, C's, and D's, um, and really kind of shows his attention to detail in terms of the uh, proportions of each letter that he has designed in this alphabet um, is really interesting. Fonts are carefully designed based on elements of design and the principles of organization that we have studied uh, last quarter, if you took uh, basic design one from me. Some of the design criteria for fonts include proportions, and that means the relative uh, heights and widths of each letter, um, and the thickness of the lines, the, the, the thickness of the spacing between each letter, um, and then the height of descenders and ascenders. And I have to I talk to you guys a minute for what descenders and ascenders are. So let's look at this, this block of text right here. And let's look at the, uh, at, the, at the words angle of letter right here. 
because the word angle is all lowercase letters and pretty much the size of the lowercase letter is kind of a, a basic building block for the font. And then where the G hangs down below this line of lowercase letters, that's a descender right there. And where the L goes up above the upper edge of the line of lowercase letters, that's an ascender. So the F, the upper portion of the F is an ascender. And you know the lower part of a P that goes below the baseline is a descender. Then we also have the angles of letters. Are they straight up and down or are they at an angle like italicized text and that kind of stuff. There's lots of different ways to change the sizes and proportions and shapes of the letters that you are designing for any particular typography or typeface. So it, it just lets us know that the reason that typefaces look different that the reason that fonts look different is because the shapes of the letters are different and the shapes of the letters are really based on how a designer designed all of the letters in the alphabet to be that particular font. Okay, so where do I go here? I got to advance this one more thing. So we're going to be using fonts in design, in our graphic design. So here's four bullet points for us to try to keep in mind while we're doing this. Each font communicates a style. The font identifies with a certain segment of history or modernity. And so a font is loaded with cultural meaning. So we as graphic designers have to match the style of the font to the style of the client or the product or the message that we are trying to communicate. Okay, so we've got words and we've got an image and we're going to put those things together. We're then going to apply a particular font to try to see if we can underscore um, the meaning of the words with this, this cultural baggage that each font carries with it. That's actually a good thing. And that's actually a way that makes, these, that makes the use of fonts a much more effective means of communication for the graphic designer. So I'm gonna come back to you guys. I'm gonna stop sharing that and come back to you. Are you guys still here? <laughs> Is everybody still here? I still got six people in the chat, uh, including myself, which is good. Okay, so let Kent, let's see. This is where I was going to stop and then <clears throat> ask you guys if anybody had a, um, a graphic design that you might have started over the weekend or something where you have pulled together, you know, in a Word document um, and, uh, a piece of some text, a quote from somebody, maybe Martin Luther King, a couple of words and an image that you're trying to put together. If you have something that you might like to share with the group, I would love to see it. So it needs to be a document open on your desktop. And then I'm going to go down here to screen share and I'm going to enable multiple participants to be able to share the screen. And now anybody, any of you people can unmute your mic and you can hit your screen share button. And now you can share the screen and I will right. pin the video to you, Skylar. I see you there. Ha ha ha. Hello. So I'm going to, I'm going to replace the pin with sky. Oh my gosh, there it is. Heck. Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. So, um, uh, okay, Skylar, uh, go ahead and you can talk uh, and tell us what the, what's going on here a little bit. Um, okay. So I, I was gonna go with the drawing that I had originally thought of, um, and it was gonna be more about equality for everyone. I was going to include, um, you know, like women. I was going to have like men, children. I was everything, um, but it looked too cartoonish. It didn't look serious enough. Oh. Um, and I didn't know how to, uh, I guess, get the point across if that makes sense without it coming across as a cartoon. Um, so I went with this instead and I, I love typography. I love working with words, uh, using the pictures to somehow uh, make, make the point across. And I, I thought this would be awesome. I looked up um, some of the women who fought for equality and this quote, uh, I don't know, it spoke to me. So I took her picture and, you know, 
I, uh, I kind of uh, darkened it a bit and then, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay, um, let me ask you a question here. Is this Susan B. Anthony or this Elizabeth Lucy Cady Stone. Stanton? Do you remember who this is? Lucy Stone. Lucy Stone, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Lucy Stone. I, if I had read, if I read, read far enough down, I would have saw Lucy Stone's name right there. Okay, Lucy Stone, and so she was one of the suffragists, um, uh, and uh, so I love what you have done here. You've taken her photograph into what the heck um, is this anyway? A Photoshop. Is this Photoshop? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you've brought her into Photoshop. And, and do you have the ability to play with text in Photoshop too? Yes. Okay. So you've done something with this text um, in terms of trying to conform it to um, the outside contours of her face. And you've got a couple of different font sizes going on here. So make this world better. Uh, fight for equality. You've got a headline and then a subhead. Then you've got Lucy Stone and her dates on there, 1818 to 1893. And you've got her face kind of superimposed in the words that are kind of in reverse, reverse type over on one side of her face, which is really cool. I love that her eye is in the word world because that's a really big, strong word. And so, and it's, it just, it it fits really good, uh, make this world a better place of putting her eye right in the middle of the OR in world is really cool. Um, so you were wondering whether this is working good enough or if it's effective enough or what to do to make it better. Is that what, what you're asking me? <laughs> yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I'm always self-doubting, so. <clears throat> well, gosh. I, I like the abstraction that you have done here because parts of her head, like her forehead and her chin and jawline are missing on the side of it where the words are. And <clears throat> so we, we play with the idea of, gosh, do we want to fill those in with the rest of the photograph or not? I kind of like that it is chopped up a little bit, that the abstraction is happening because it makes the words stronger than if they were trying to just be superimposed on top of the photograph of her face you get you've left us with half of her face uh or maybe just a little bit less than half because of where the nose is um but anyway i think it's super effective um, 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 um i don't know what else to do have you tried to put <laughs> maybe just a tiny little wash of some color in the words, like a sepia tone, or a very, very light yellow, or something, or not, because it doesn't really have to be there. I was just wondering if that made the words then too much different than her face that was just all in black and white over on the right side of the screen. Um, I can try it. Yeah, I, I, I can try. Okay, you can do stuff like that, or, or here's another idea. I love what the big words are doing is really, really effective. It, so make this world better. I wouldn't maybe touch that, but maybe in the smaller words that are down in the bottom, maybe try to give them some kind of a very light color wash of some kind. It's almost like watercolor. You know, to try to put just a five or 10% sepia tone or a 5% uh, or 10% a color or something in there just to see what happens. And maybe it's gonna look like she has a beard and then we don't wanna do that. Um, in fact, it, it already, because of the texture of the smaller letters you know, together, it kind of does make her look like she has a beard because it comes right below the chin. Not that that's a bad thing, but it's just like, you know, these are the kinds of things that another pair of eyes will notice and then they'll tell back to the graphic designer. And then you can say, oh, I didn't see that or oh, Maybe you saw that and that wasn't a, a big deal for you or whatever. I do like what you have done here, though. I love how these words are conforming to, um, uh, to, to the face and, and what's going on here with this stacked uh, vertical uh, set of um, uh, text. Um, did you have 
uh, I don't know, any ideas or questions about anything that you thought you might want to try in, in terms of moving stuff or changing the font or anything? I mean, this font is really skinny, but you need to do that to fit the words into the side of her face. Um, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> This is good because this takes a big risk. And part of being a bold graphic designer is to be able to take risks uh, and try stuff that you know, you're taking artistic risks and you're trying to bring your, bring your audience along with you. You're trying to bring either the client who is, has hired you to do the graphic design because you're trying to sell this to the client but also ultimately you're trying to sell the client's um, audience, whether they are um, customers or whether it's the public or whatever it is, you're trying to sell them on um, the concept. And so, um, yeah, the words, you know, chop her face up a little bit. And so it kind of looks monstrous and ghastly somewhat, but if you spend time with it and if you zoom in and you really see the gentleness of her eyes, you know, um, unifying both sides of the composition. Um, I think it really works and it's pretty strong, but it, it, is, it is an abstraction. And so it, it is a pretty big leap for that kind of thing. Um, so what do you think after I've said all those wonderful, uh, crazy ideas and stuff? Um, do you have a reaction to my reaction? Um. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, did, were you seeing that um, the, the text kind of broke up her face quite a bit and made it a little bit harder for, to recognize her? Okay. This is good, thank you. Um, I was just signing a piece of paper for another student who knocked on my door. So I was distracted there for about 10 seconds. But that's the thing, that's the compromise that we're trying to strike in something like a, um, a graphic design is, you know, you're bold because you brought the words right into her face, which is a really, really strong, huge risk to take. And I think this risk is paying off here. Now, to everybody else who's looking at this, you guys do not have power, uh, sorry, uh, Photoshop. You guys are not in the digital design class. And this is a very powerful um, graphic design software. And so I do not expect anybody else to try to do this kind of thing unless you are in the digital design class and you have Photoshop and have been using it for a while. But so um, thank you. Um, I guess uh, if you would, uh, you could end the screen share here and uh, give it back to me if you can find the, the red button for ending it. And um, I just, I thought that was a dynamite um, uh, piece of graphic design. But like I said, you know, that the compromise in graphic design is being bold and getting in there and mixing it up with the letters and the image to the point where sometimes you can't see the whole image anymore. Then it becomes a little bit abstracted and that's a challenge to your viewers. And so um, I like the challenge or the, the risk that you're taking there. That was really good. Does that give you enough feedback for what you wanted from me? The rest of it, I'm going to have to think about. The only thing I can say is to maybe try to adding just a little teeny bit of wash of color, either to all of the text or maybe the, the lower block of text. Um, in graphic design, we usually try to make three or four versions of our graphic design to try to see which one is better. So please save your... Um, your states of this thing. Save your stages so that you have two or three or four states of this. And then you can play with ones and, and do some even stronger um, abstractions with them. And then you can um, look at all four of the different ones side by side to see which one is the most effective one. That's usually what graphic designers have to do because we don't know what looks good until we actually compare things and contrast things. And then we say, that one looks the best because it's the clearest in communication without muddying other things up. And, you know, that's what art is about, that, that there's an art to design where there's, you don't know what the end, what the outcome is going to be, what the end result is going to be. You have to just um, take chances with it and see what happens. Okay, that was good.
Does anybody else have any questions or anybody else have one that they might want to share with the group? I have enabled crazy screen sharing. So now you guys can take over um, the I, television I, and you can share I, from your thing. I, and I have, Ezra, I see you're up uh, and after something here. What do you got? You got one that you might want to share? Maybe. Here it comes. Okay. Oh my gosh, this is great. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And, you know, Martin Luther King uh, had all kinds of writings. He had, you know, letters from the Birmingham jail, which this may have come from there. Um, he wrote lots and lots of stuff. He wrote several books. Um, so there's a rich bunch of uh words and text to, to draw upon from, from Martin Luther King. This is fantastic. I love the photograph. Is this a photograph from inside of a jail cell? Uh oh, I can't hear you. My mic working? I, I can barely hear you now. Have you been talking for a while and I've been talking right over you? Uh, yeah, my microphone might be messed okay. up actually. He Try to get really close to your microphone and I'll shut the hell up. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, you sound great. All right, sir. Yeah, this is a photograph of when he was in the Birmingham jail. Oh, yeah. I remembered reading about this in high school, so I chose this photograph. And then I remember, and then I found this quote on online and uh, thought they went together fairly decently. Still not sure how to put them together though. Okay, this is really good. Let me ask you some questions here. So did the whole photograph, including this black um, negative space over here, did that kind of all come together? Um, well, at first I tried doing a clear background, but the thing, the text wouldn't show up right because the bars have different uh, values to them okay um did you make this black uh box and put it in on top of the photograph of uh, yes Good. yeah I did. okay that's fantastic um <clears throat> i love the image I like, I like the amount of uh, marginal space that is behind his head as well as in front of his face. I like the fact that we can see the bars here. The only thing I'm having trouble with is integrating the text block with the image. Now, one of the things that helps is that his, his face is in profile and his eyes are looking this way. Not only are his eyes looking this way, but we also have the bar kind of giving us a direct connection a visual linkage between his face and the text box. So these two horizontal bars are doing a really good job helping to pull this stuff together. The only thing that I would like to do maybe is to take the right edge of the black text box and pull it just a little further towards the right and then recenter the text uh, in the space because the, the text box just seems a little teeny bit far to the left. Now, maybe you've already done that and it was unsatisfactory and so you, you put it back the way it was, which I totally understand. But those are the kinds of things that uh, we do as graphic designers. We play with the relative size and scale of the text box with the image to try to get them to, to unite and integrate as much as possible. I love this photograph. I've never seen it before. I like how thoughtful he looks with his hand, with the index finger um, against his chin like that. He looks thoughtful as he's grasping the bar with his other hand. Okay, if you get anything else you wanted to talk about about this one, you'll have to really lean in so that I can hear you. Um, no, nothing else. Uh, should I stop sharing? Ezra, this is fantastic. This is a really good start. Thank you very much for sharing this. Um, and if you can like um, 
upload this to our our course um, coursework, and I can find a copy of it. I might be able to open this up, and then I could play with this uh, in front of God and everybody next time. And I I could play with it, or I can play with a copy of it so that I don't mess up your original. Um, but I would just like to play around with the text and you know the fonts and everything else. I love the font that you've chosen. It's a um, <clears throat> pretty much a sans serif font. I like that very much. Uh, actually, that was kind of just the uh, the font that. I didn't actually change the fonts yet, so I was just that's getting it. That was the default setting? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Martin Luther King is a modern figure. He's a mid-20th century figure, and so using a, um, a mid-20th century font to go along with him, a modern font, um, is, a, is a good way to um, give a message that had... Uh, that was brand new and was super thoughtful and perhaps ahead of its time in the early part or in the middle part of the 20th century and still resonates with us today. Thank you very much. That's good. If you can hit the stop share button. Hey, there we are. There we go. Um, I wanted to do a quickie with you guys. Is there anybody else who had one that they wanted to share today? And I bet there isn't because, you know, who else would have one that was, you know, ready to go. But my, um, my yet. challenge for you guys, oh, Amanda, look at Sorry. that. <laughs> Who's that? I'm halfway done, but it's not on this computer. Um, my laptop has a microphone and a better camera. So I've been using this one for schoolwork, but I do have one on a different computer. I just can't log into Zoom and screen share it yet. I haven't figured that out. <laughs> okay. I, I got most of that. Um, you're going to have to really lean in towards your microphone too, because it's barely picking up. But um, if you can get that on the other computer and share it with us next time, that'd be fantastic. Okay. Thank you. I, I've been doing this for 40 minutes. Let me do something really quick for the last five or 10. I'm going to try another screen share and see if I've got a document here. Okay. Here's one that I was working on this morning. Um, I've got a couple pages here. Um, this is a picture that I found of um, the police officer uh, with George Floyd. Um, and the police officer had George Floyd in this control hold and held him here for eight minutes and 47 seconds until George Floyd died of asphyxiation on the ground. This was this happened, you know, early um, in 2020, and resulted in all of the protests that were in many in many um, large cities around the world, and not just in the United States. The quote is a Martin Luther King quote: "The arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice." And so I was playing with it. This is a cell phone photograph, and so it's vertical as a photograph. And I brought it in here, and it was actually um, a photograph that I had to crop. But you can crop even in Microsoft Word. You can crop. I gotta move. I gotta move. I don't even know if you guys can see this, but I gotta move that down so that I can do this. So if I, I'm going to um, click on the photograph so I can do that, and then for insert, let's see, or no, for for um, picture tools right up here. When I, when I click on picture tools, when I've got a picture um, highlighted, I can click on picture tools up here. And this gives me a whole bunch of stuff to play with. Way over here, I can actually crop the photograph. Here's your cropping tool. So I'm gonna click the cropping tool, which gives me this. Now the original photograph was the gray area. And so I can undo the crop and I can go back out to the original uh, you know, photograph if I wanted to or I can crop in here even tighter if I wanted to crop him tighter. And then I can release the cropping tool, go over here one more time and, and click down here, click and drag till it drops down to crop and I can hit the word crop and then it crops it for me. So you guys can actually crop photographs to get rid of um, extraneous parts, parts that don't belong there, parts that you don't need and to get to something that's essential. Um, because this was a vertical photograph, I was trying to then play with what am I going to do with, with text. And since the photograph was so tight in here, I didn't know if I wanted to have my text actually impinging into the negative spaces of the photograph. So I ran my text uh, outside of the photograph to make a little bit 
longer, wider thing, but that meant I had to run my text as pretty much a vertical text box. So I never like the way that the text, um, the text actually is. Um, the line spacing on the text is, is horrible. It's deplorable. There's always too much space between lines um, with the line spacing of text. So I have to make my lines into individual text boxes so that I can slide individual text boxes up as close as I want to. And sometimes, you know, I'm kind of a crazy designer where I like stuff to be really, really close together. So when I say the arc of history is long and I want to slide this way up there to really get close and intimate with my text box, my text line spacing, I can I can space my lines really close together. But then I can also have individual boxes where I can, you know, I can um, open up spacing too. And so all of these text boxes are individual. And I was just trying to play with the idea of how much um, spacing I wanted. And I've even got the J injustice down here um, landing as a descender below the line of the bottom of the photograph here because I really feel like there's a downward pressure, there's a downward um, movement in the photograph. And so I just want to take the J and almost like the knee on poor George Floyd's neck, it's descending below the, the line of the photograph. But I, I've got these uh, spaced out, just a little bit more spaced further apart than the lines up here. And I could still, if I can find the edge of this text, box for this word, thank you, I could, you know, kind of float these down to where they're closer together and just play with the, um, if I could find this last text box, where are you? Where's the edge of it? I have to keep clicking on it until it appears. And then, then I've got the arc of history is long and then kind of a natural space but it bends toward justice. And the irony of this uh, juxtaposed with this image is very stark and very dark. And this is a very scary thing. And so on the next page, I tried it again. And this time I broke up the text and I put it, I put half of the quote over on one side and half the quote over on the other side. And then, you know, highlighted it, uh, the word history and changed the, the um, color of that text to red using the, the font color. And I did it with the word justice too, so that I had red, which symbolically is about passion and blood and death and violence and everything else has been brought in here. So we've got all the cool colors of the grays and the blue of his uniform and all of that and the blacks, whoops, I got it. I'm trying to click on this to get that turned off again. Um, so we've got the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And so depending on the spacing that you're gonna put this and where this wants to go in a, um, in a news article, in a magazine article, on a website, you know, that kind of depends on what on how you want to play with the words and stuff. But I'm just playing with this as a graphic design, as an artwork. And so uh, the arc of history is long. And then on the same line as long, but continuing over on the other side is where I put the word but. And then another space, it bends towards justice. And justice is right here exactly lined up on the same horizontal axis as George Floyd's head. So those were two uh, approaches that I did this morning with the morning class to try to play with this stuff. Do you guys want to chime in? And if you do, if you want to make a comment, you're going to have to bend in really close to your um, microphone to say anything. But please uh, pipe right up if anybody has a comment that you'd like to say. And if not, I'm going to do the I'm going to stop share and come back to you guys. Okay, so you can see how diabolically difficult this is. It's super simple. We've got a photograph and we've got text. It can be, it can be, you know, two or three words. 
It can be a quote from somebody. Sometimes the shorter quotes are better. And sometimes if you can feel like you can actually edit the words of Martin Luther King to edit the quote down to something that's very succinct and gets rid of some of extra or unnecessary language, a, a shorter quote is better for graphic design. So um, sometimes, you know, we work with just the essential piece of the quote as a graphic designer, and we have the audacity to edit, you know, a great thinker like Martin Luther King Jr. But anyway, so play with these ideas. If you can come up with words and text that you can put together into a, a Microsoft Word document for next time that we can share on screen share, we can play with this and we can start to nudge these words around, enlarging them just a little bit, changing their spacing just a little bit, nudging them in closer and trying to find maybe negative spaces in the photograph that they would fit better. And this is the second part. This is the, this is the finesse part of graphic design that we do as designers. So I'm gonna leave it there for today. We've we covered a lot of ground today in a very short time. There's, a, there's gonna be a recording of this um, that you can access in the YouTube recordings in my Laker link. If you'd like to see this again, you can definitely fast forward through all the boring parts and get to the stuff that really deals with your questions that you might have about um, doing graphic design um, in this particular kind of a method. So I'm going to quit for now. I'm going to um, say goodbye for now, and I'll see you guys again on Wednesday at one o'clock. Thank you very much. See you on Wednesday.